Hello, 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 beautiful people. Welcome to Whole Hearts Production Homegrown Festival VIP Law Symposium titled Strength, Courage, and Wisdom. And so we have a lovely evening of panelists who all possess the tenacity of strength, the courage to stand on the ground and rise above, and the wisdom to connect with their inner selves and their spiritual community and to love on the people that we call our black and brown community. With that being said, I'd like to introduce our panel. Janaki Flint, clinical psychologist. Good evening, Omalara D, social service manager. Good evening, Maxwell Louis Waterman, trauma-informed educator. Hello, Winston Bennett Jr., cultural researcher, arts educator, and choreographer. Hello, I'm Kristen Carter Porret. I am a um, dance instructor and founder of Julie Killen, as well as a financial planner and accountant. Hi, I'm Fumi Lyo. I am a health coach and an artistic director. You should dance with me. Hello, everyone. My name is Neville. I am a yoga instructor as well as an Ayurveda advisor. And there's our panel for tonight, you guys. So I hope you guys all have an adult beverage of your choice. Everybody lift it up. Because we're in the VIP loft, baby. We about to have some real talk here, okay? Let's say cheers and have your first step. And just so you know, my name is Kelly White. I am the director of Evolve Diaspora. I am the associate producer of this segment. And also, I am tonight's moderator. So I'll be guiding you guys on this journey. Wish me luck, because Lord knows they have some tea to spill. I would say not tea to spill, but some energy to give to the community, okay? So let's get this party started, you guys. Let's get it started. We need some appetizers to help set up our taste buds for our evening of flavorful conversation. So I'm gonna start off with my friend Maxwell. Come on, Max. Let me know. How do you define community? Mm. I define community as the people um, that are surrounding me that are giving me um, the access, um, the resources to grow. Um, because I believe that a child or a person is only as good um, as the resources that they're given. So that's what community um, means for me. Okay, we're gonna popcorn it out. Anybody want else wanna jump in? How do you define community? Because this is a community project and we're all about the community, we're homegrown. So we need to know what, what lens you're coming from, what view. How do you define community? For me, it's the, it is the people that are in your, obviously in your neighborhood. Um, it could be your work community, the people that you associate, associate yourself with. Um, you can have a dance community, the people that you, you know, do drum and circle with. Um, your community is what, for me, is what you make it. You know, it, your community can be anything that you decide that you want to bring into your space. Okay. I agree with that. Um, your community, you, you definitely make your community. Um, and for me, community means individuals who are close to or on the same vibrational level as you and have good intent. So even when they're challenging you, they're challenging you so that you can grow, not to take you down. Um, so that was, that's some things I would, I would add to the, the group definition, definitely. Yeah, I would agree with you, Winston. Um, the community is like, we are a community right now, the group of us that are here right now. We have similar values and similar goals. 
and um, we are on the same vibrational level and we're woke and we are um, entrepreneurs and trying to make it in this very, very hard and uh, racist system that we live in. I'm sure. The Dean community is people of shared history, tradition, languages, and culture that come together for growth, for health and healing, for legacy, for building, for the present, the future, and looking to the past to ground that. Nice. For me, so I, I, I consider myself as a huge community person. Um, in addition to what everyone else said, I think that community truly shows itself when it's able to not only support itself, um, but sustain because of that support. So um, the, a community should be able to share interests, share likes, share um, education so that the entire community could grow as a whole. Um, and if your community is not really very supportive of you, you should probably ask, is this really a community? Is this really my community? Because your community should definitely, definitely contribute to your growth. Uh, I would just add that a community is, uh, for me, is a group of chosen family. Individuals who choose to show up for you, who choose to pour into you. They understand that they don't that that we're not individuals, but then together the collective, and that's what makes us powerful, and that's what makes us community. So that that choice that they're choosing to show and support you that makes a strong community. Great. All right. So let's open a floor. Let's get all into it. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts, you guys, on the arts and cultural practices in regards to Black and Brown people? What are your thoughts? Who wants to take that ball in the court first? Okay. Well, our <laughs> you want to go first, Winston? You can go ahead. You can go ahead. You got the same bite out. Okay. <laughs> well, in regards to the conversation about community, um, with specificity to the Black um, and Brown arts community, I believe that we have a lot of work to do um, with our conditioning. Um, the design principles, the thought patterns that we're using to um, manifest our life. Um, it doesn't matter what area you're working in within the community. If your thought processes are not healthy, um, then everything that you try to do eventually um, will become dismantled, even if it's for, um, temporary. Um, and I think we as a people, specifically POC people, um, need to acknowledge that the same mechanisms of Eurocentric and patriotism that we complain about, we also do internalize them and use them on each other. And once we get clear about that, then we'll be really able to flourish authentically. Because a lot of us think that we're flourishing, but we're really not. Um, because there's still some you know, discrepancies in the way we're thinking. And we need to understand that we matter. And because we are literally matter, right? Because matter takes up space. Um, <laughs> we need to understand that how we do and what we do matters. Because when you take up space, it causes an impact. Um, and what you're thinking causes an impact. So if you change the thinking, you change the impact. Um, so I was just, when, um, when Neville was talking, he talked about um, a community. Um, what stuck out to me was a community that shows up. Um, because my thought pattern, I've, I'm in a community mm -hmm. where people support you, but they don't necessarily show up. So is it still considered a community if people don't show up? Is it still, would you still consider somebody a community if they don't show up? Um, and and my, my thoughts around it is yes. There, I, I, I absolutely believe there's still a community. Some people might just need a little extra shoving, should I say, you know, to, to, to make them realize that um, one thing that's really important about a community is that we support, like I said, support one another 
and even though you're not there you can still be there because your presence your thoughts are always still with us so those thoughts the the physical physically being there mentally being there mentally healing together all of that kind of moves you in the same in the same way when you're part of the community so if you don't show up you're still a part of the community but it's just in a, in a different sense and and it's important for people who might think that they don't need to show up that we, we do need you all of us need each other because we consider each other as a part of the community and if all of us are not present then how can we move forward together can i add to what christian just said um there are also part portions of the community that are not necessarily considered part of the community and i'm speaking specifically about homeless people people that are down and out um lgb lgbtq family uh people people that are trans that are really in the moment right now and being um they're being the the their presence is being heightened because of all the violence against them um so i want to make sure that um that i also add that those people, those are other parts of our community, and we are not always accepting or embracing of those other facets of the community, but yet they are still part of the community. And added to your point, Omalara, the reason why we don't consider them a part of the community is, again, we've adopted this system, which was taught to us from slavery days, about how to marginalize people. Because we have a, you know, tendency to think that, oh, well, because you look a certain way, you act a certain way, you get to be part of us. But no, humanity does not include separateness. It's only abundance. If you look at nature, everybody is you know, everybody as far as the trees and the flowers and whatnot, they grow and they don't compete with each other. So why are we competing with each other? Because it's taught to us. And we have to learn that as much as there is a beauty in learning, there's also a beauty in unlearning. And in addition to that, I think we also have to understand the value of, of who we are, right? And all the extensions of who we are. So the arts is one of the ways that we manifest divine energy. Um, and I think um, going back to this, you know, a Eurocentric model where the arts is this thing that you kind of go to look at and then you leave, you discuss, you write about, but you don't experience and live in it. You don't fully um, cultivate it and transmit it, right? Mm -hmm. And that comes from, you know, one of the places that comes from is Africa, right? Where we are a people who we create, cultivate, transmit um, energy through the arts. And so many of us don't fully understand that or don't understand the true value of that um, and how, you know, the arts has, has started revolutions and kept revolutions going, right, throughout history. Um, so I, to add to, to all of their points, I think understanding the value of the artistic expressions um, that's created by community members within the community is very important to the expansion of, um, of the community and its growth in terms of its emotional IQ. Well, Lyle, I have a question. Knowing that you are a uh, health coach and nutrition is a big part of your practice, I wonder um, how your practice is like influencing people of color, black people and brown people. And we also have a couple other um, holistic teachers online too with us. So i like to know um, exactly their um, thoughts too. Unmute yourself. Sorry, can you repeat what you just said? Sorry. How can I? I so as a health coach? Yes. Um, in the cultural practices and in knowing that you incorporate um, your coaching in, I believe your target areas are of people of color and black people and their health. How does that, you know, your practice in regards to help us or impact us or empower us? Yes. Um, Knowing what we ingest and what we put in our bodies on a daily basis and knowing the science of the whole 
nutrition um, lifestyle. Knowing that um, as with your body, you have to pretend your body is a house. And it's a daily thing that you must clean the house a little bit, do something to clear your house. And so we have to think of our bodies as entities that have to be nourished every day and also be healed every day, be cleansed every day, and um, be able to do everything that we needed to do before we retire in the evening. So basically starting our day cleansing, fasting, I believe that during this time we need to fast. Eating too much is not the thing to be doing right now. The more, the less eating we do right now, the best. The best. I feel intermittent fasting right now is very important. And also being able to move our bodies and being able to have access to organic foods, um, going to the farmer's market and getting our organic foods or trying to grow our own food on our fire escape or if we have a backyard, this is the time to do things like that. This is the time to, to become independent of the system as far as whether our food is organic or not. So we sh our goal should be trying to get organic foods our goal should be trying to get um, meats that are not hormoned and antibiotics. Our goal is to nourish our soul with dance, nourish our soul with these any any sort of artistic, anything artistic that will help us to to deal with what we're dealing with right now. Neville or um since I'm calling you Neville, you ready? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready because uh, this topic is very important about, you know, what we put in our bodies. We literally are what we eat. Um, and, you know, to add to what my sister was just saying, it takes just more than just cleaning our body because we need to give our bodies what we need in that moment. Um, and part of what I study in Ayurveda is this understanding of understanding your body. And the path to yoga is really a path through yourself, through your body, uh, to come home. And we as black people, our bodies have retained so much trauma. Um, and we can't just get through the trauma through uh, physical practices and other things of that nature. Our food and the qualities of the food that we take, that we ingest, also help us to relieve this trauma. So we have been taught to really uh, eat poor diets that keep us in a state where we can be manipulated. And when we start to understand who we are, we start to understand what we are, and then we understand the role that, that food plays in our bodies. Food is medicine. We believe that 80% of the diseases that we have can be prevented. And if we are eating nutritious meals, um, eating the right quantities, as, as was stated earlier, and the right types of food for your body and your body type, then you can prevent a whole lot of medical bills. And it's something that, that we've just been programmed to say, you know, let's, let's just go to the doctor and get some medication. And I'm here to interrupt that story and say, no, let's go to the source. Let's go to the source of our foods and let's use our food as medicine. And then the systems that are in place need to do better by number one, our children, and number two, by making these farmers markets, for example, or these other types of food, um, um, you know, places to receive food or to get food, even in our supermarkets, things that are more healthy, that are more appetizing, they're going to get what's there. The person that is on 125th Street is not necessarily going to Whole Foods because Whole Foods is extremely expensive. Even the most healthiest, the healthiest foods that they have there, they're not traveling to Union Square or well, here in New York, Union Square, farmer's market to go and get anything. When I go to Union Square, I don't see people that look like me. I see people that look, that are, that are not brown and black folks. That's what I will say. So. Okay. so uh, sorry, go ahead. So I think that um, to, ta to piggyback on what you're saying, the education of um, starting from first grade, second grade, our students should be educated about 
just health and wellness, how to eat, how to take care of ourselves, how to even grow food, how to plant, so we can already create a community that we start a garden, we start a greenhouse, where the community um, grows the greenhouse and gain the revenues from the greenhouse, because in the end, that food might be even too much for the community and can even go further to uh, be given to restaurants in the neighborhood that can start becoming your vendors. It could go into something really big. So I think that starting a community greenhouse, starting a community garden, um, having kids be really injected with lots of information about health and wellness and just the basic, the basics. It's the basics, I think, to start them out and also getting the parents involved and getting the parents uh, programs that educate them as well. And, and also how to, how to eat on a budget, how to plan, how to prepare, and then how to um, make sure that your meal is, is nourished and not, you know, junk. So. Right, and I was just gonna chime in because I feel like that's where our community comes into. Um, that's, this, it all ties back to community. Um, this is not something that they're gonna teach in schools because they don't want our kids to have it. So it, it all ties back to community. I, I'm gonna say it, I'm, I'm a part of a huge community here in Atlanta and, and have been very fortunate that the things that I didn't know, the things that I don't know as a parent, I have people here that have contributed to my kids to make sure that they were well-rounded in the community sense. And I really, really appreciate having that. So our community, and, and they wouldn't have known my, my needs, they wouldn't have known my needs, but knowing our community, we don't talk enough, we don't communicate enough. So, so I don't know what you do. I don't know, you know, I don't know what the other person does. I don't know what the other person needs, but when you start communicating, when you start being more engulfed and more involved in your community, you get to learn or you start learning different things that you can take and, and build your community because everyone is not gonna need the same amount of inf information. Everybody's going to be an individual, but if you know one another's needs, you can you can pull together and pull your resources together to make sure that everyone's needs are met and that the whole community grows as a whole. Yeah. So great. I'm gonna hop right on in and say, sorry, Winston. That's okay. <laughs> um, because you guys are hearing a lot of points I want to discuss tonight, and I was like, we need to unpack, unveil slowly, 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 please. We can't get the whole body away right now, um, but. I want to know you guys, because we're talking about community, we're talking about, you know, um, advocating for our, our, our black and brown people um, in the arts and the community at large. But my main question right now is that how do we as black people and brown people show up for ourselves and each other? We already touched on the diet part and nutrition and education and that, but how else can we be of support? Um, I'm going to ask this to Janaki because she's our therapist on deck yeah okay i'm gonna ask you to repeat that question <clears throat> how do we as black and brown people show up for ourselves and each other uh, how you know knowing that you are a therapist and you see you know um a lot of your clients um and your patients they how are you training them or getting them to understand the power of showing up for themselves and what tools are you giving them, I guess, is another part. Well, yeah, well, <clears throat> we don't have enough time for, all, for the tools. <laughs> but, but what I will say is one of the things that I, I do and I'm very passionate about is the client's own agency over their bodies and their understanding of the body's anatomical processes, neurological processes, physical processes. And that may seem like it's counterintuitive for therapy. And a lot of my clients kind of look at me glazed over initially, like, why aren't you asking me? So how do you feel about that? Which they hate. Uh, <laughs> and so why are you educating me on my body? Right. But at the end of generally, I, I like to have clients that end up becoming self-sufficient. So I don't believe in having clients for years. That's to me, just feels crazy. Um, pardon the pun. Um, but 
towards the end of their work, when they're ready to kind of self-sustain, they really get it and they really have an education about that. And so um, hearkening back to what we were talking about before, I think that the arts is in a unique position to create a culture of body awareness. Um, something in, in my field we call proprioception, which is the awareness of your body in space and time. That is something that we don't typically do. We, we ignore our bodies. We focus up here. We leave this whole other part alone. And we don't recognize that what is happening in this whole other part is happening up here. And so one of the things that I do to help people show up for themselves is before I even want to know anything about your history, I want to walk you through the ability to hold and contain a space for your body, especially when you feel uncomfortable because it's those uncomfortable feelings that we avoid, which is why we go to the food, the drugs, and the what have you, the sex, all of that. And so we do that work first, and then we can kind of layer it, pull everything else back in. So I, that's the way that in which I talk to clients about really showing up for themselves is to identify that they have this sacred body made of the same things that the constellations are made up of. And we walk through that body and, and why it is processing and how it is processing and how it will show up for them when they need it. And how to use it as a resource for healing. Akila, can you ask the same, answer the question um, about how do you show up for yourself? Um, first of all, introduce yourself because um, you just came to the party and your role, and then you can also um, then answer the question. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Akila Tony, and I'm a writer, poet, and youth advocate. Um, I'm happy to be here to see everyone and hear all the wisdom to come in. Um, but definitely uh, for me, uh, how do I show up for my own self is advocating for myself that's been a big journey for me and making sure that I have what I need as, as a young person because many a times um people ask me can you do this can you do that or um can you write this for us or can you do this really quickly like you know someone as an artist you know people want so much of you and I've been learning to say no um, and, and, and I've been learning to what I need to preserve for myself as an artist. Like maybe I shouldn't share this poem yet, or maybe I shouldn't, you know, share this piece yet. Um, and just keep things for myself, keep my art for myself, because, you know, everything you write doesn't have to be put out there. You can, you know, hold it for yourself like a little baby and, and it can grow and be something else. That's what I've been learning. Um, is to advocate for yourself and ask for what you need. Um, like my dad tells me, he's like, it's okay to ask for help sometimes. Like, and I've been and I've been learning that and listening to that voice because you don't have to do everything on your own. You know, you don't have to be like this strong individual doing everything by themselves all the time. You know, a lot of times there are like-minded young people around me who have the same, you know, passions and you know, artistic, you know, creations as me. And we just want to share. And we just want to share that space. So. I've been learning not to do things alone, but also um, advocate my advocate for myself in spaces where they do want young people. Beautiful, and I can just say, learning to set up boundaries is amazing tool that anyone should practice. Doesn't matter what color, and no, it's okay. <laughs> no, it's definitely okay. Or not right now, it's okay. In addition to that, of like. As people of color, sometimes we're afraid to ask for help. We get shunned a lot. We think we're supposed to know everything. Um, are we afraid to, to reveal that we don't know everything because we don't want to be judged? And so to know that you can pull back that layer and tap into like, no, I, I need to really figure this out and I need to go to a source to figure it out is a great, great tool that we all need to use. Anybody else want to ask, answer that question? How do you um, show up for yourself or the community? at well, large you bring up a great point kelly because again because of the mechanisms that you know we use to navigate that are harmful we are ashamed to express our needs which is why a lot of us don't ask for help and then we end up marginalizing our own selves and decrease our own access to equity because we won't ask for help but the way we can reverse that 
when you say like, how do you show up for yourself and for others is I believe everyone should have a spiritual maintenance plan. The same way you need to put gas in the car, you need to find something that fuels you and it looks different for everybody. Mine is to wake up and journal. Maybe yours is to go for swimming. It doesn't matter what it is, but something that, you know, uplifts your wattage in life, gets you going. And then once you're able to pour into yourself, then you can pour into somebody else because it's true. You, you, you can only give others what's on the inside of you. And then when you become kinder to yourself, another thing that happens is that we learn how to communicate with compassion because we're so violent. You know, don't leave me out here by myself. We are all very violent. And you don't have to physically use curse words to be violent, but your negative energy that you carry around can be very, very, very violent. And that's why some of us, again, don't feel comfortable to ask for help because we don't want to deal with that violence because I got my own thing going on. I don't need yours. But if we just, you know, take care of within because everything comes from inside out, we can really, you know, create this world that we call a utopia, but we can really live in it. And you don't have to wait for your healing. You can create it now. That's a myth. You don't have to wait for anything. You can create it now. So choice is yours. Maxwell, I think you're really on to something. The word compassion is critical for us. Um, and I'm glad you said the word violence because it is a, a form of white body supremacy, this violence that we internalize and we turn on ourselves. And self-compassion is one of the biggest pieces. You know, compassion is just an ancient word meaning to suffer with. We, it's easy for us to suffer with someone else and to even cry when they cry. But in my practice, when I turn that on to someone and I say, well, how do you show up and, and support yourself? That somehow feels awkward. So the, the output is, is automatic, but the input feels somehow un uncomfortable because we're not socialized for self-compassion. And so one of the things that we try, we, we try to do, I don't like to say what we should do or shouldn't do because I know there's a process to get people to doing anything. Um, and that process is a journey, not a destination. But one of the things that are, is very helpful for, I, I think for any community is to start with our children, learning that process of self-compassion, learning how to give ourselves kindness, kind words. That's a vibration that's coming out of your mouth. These are air molecules, literally. So that's in its resonance. So there's a lot of medicine in what you say, what, the, what we call ofoashe, right? That, that word that comes from your mouth and the sound of that and the medicine elixir in those words. What are you saying? It's medicine. So giving yourself affirmations and words of kindness, whether you call that spirituality, vibration, whatever it is, it is. And then the second part to that is understanding the communal aspect. Um, I think I've said this before, that the very definition of being disordered is being an individual without your community. Your community is your healing, <laughs> literally. So, and then understanding that there's a common humanity. If you are suffering, someone is suffering with you in the community, suffer with, right? And then the last part of that is being mindful and connected to that feeling. When we start to avoid the feeling, that is when we perpetuate suffering. And so being able to connect to the inevitable pain, because pain is inevitable. There are things that are going to happen in our lives that we have absolutely no control over. But when we try to avoid how we feel about that, it gets stuck, it gets held in our bodies as stuck energy. And that creates a lot of things from immune uh, deficiencies to high blood pressure and on and on and on to PTSD and on and on. So I think the issue of, of self-compassion is really critical. I was just and, and, and just share that, um, you know, the way that I show for myself and the way that I encourage others to show for themselves is to become aware. It really takes you to become aware of yourself, aware of your body, aware of your mental state, aware of your emotional state, 
and it takes that uh, what Janaki and, and Maxwell were talking about is this non judgmental awareness. That's where compassion comes from. You can be compassionate and share in your in, in the suffering if you can be non judgmental in your own body and in your own mind about your own experience. And sometimes it just takes us to separate ourselves from the distractions of our lives and just sit with ourselves. So often we're distracting ourselves with television, with social media, with a conversation. We call people just to talk about nothing, just to distract ourselves from our own reality. And it really takes us, you know, finding that alone time and creating that alone time, making so that you can uh, become non judgmentally aware of what's happening in your experience in your life. Yes, um, I agree with what you're saying uh, 100%. During this time, we, we tend to try to distract ourselves. And I think that what we should be doing is we should be creating and re reinventing ourselves during this time, not getting stuck into what was, but start walking into what is and what will be. And so um, I totally agree with, with that. Yes. I totally agree too, because let me tell you, I've had to like mute my phone sometimes from calls. And I, and, and some people that I talk to every day, I usually talk to every day, I've like decreased the amount of time because being in, you know, on lockdown, COVID lockdown, <laughs> it's like, I just needed to quiet my mind and find that space to check in on myself to take care of myself and show up for myself and make sure I'm cultivating the work that I need to do. So I had to stop distracting myself and taking myself away from the extra noise, clouding my thoughts in my brain, which is so, so, so distracting and sometimes can actually stop you from progress. And then my spiritual practice, oh yes, I had to like amp that up 10 times. <laughs> like literally like snapping over my head, <laughs> you know, my friend, one of my friends, she has a healing um, forks and I'm like, give me the forks. <laughs> <laughs> this, this pluming me up and everything like that. I mean, for real, it's, it's amped up. Um, Winston, Benins, Julia, you're up next, boo-boo. Hello. Hello. So my question to you. Mm -hmm. um, looking through the lens of what I, and Omolara, it's for you too, okay? Don't, don't think you, you just chime in. But looking through the lens of what our present day education system looks like and feels like, right? Looking through that lens. And dreaming of what a black holistic arts education and education model would be. Um, yeah? Mm -hmm. Start unveiling to me what those policies and thoughts are around that, like um, pulling back the layers. Oh, he's ready, I'm gonna just quiet. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're in an interesting place now because because of this pandemic, um, a lot of areas we're forced to pivot, we're forced to reimagine, uh, we're forced to rework um, the ways and the processes that we normally use, right? So specific to education, you know, it, the, you know COVID came in and it happened quick, right? One time we were teaching in the classroom and actually in March, right? So we went through most of the school year and as educators by March, you've already set your tone, you have relationships with your students, you've gone through most of the year of what it is that you wanna accomplish, you've tried new things, you know what works, what doesn't work, so you have a feeling of posting through. And immediately we were like, stopped and we had to like readjust because now we have to go to distance learning um and we have to figure out how to teach kids um how to use that synchronous and asynchronous types of learning modes to really teach kids in in the same way right without a lot of planning um so i think there are some instances from march to june where uh, depending on the school, depending on the support that you have from the administration in your school, um, depending on many different factors, uh, you are more or less effective, right? Um, but we have this summer to think about that. And I think um, one thing I noticed is that unfortunately, the arts was um, kind of relegated to the fringe because 
administration was focused in on core subjects. And I think to add to the second part of your question in terms of looking at it from an African diasporan um, lens or point of view, it should have been the other way around, right? It should have really worked to, and, and actually speak to the arts educators, right? Because we're there, we're doing it. Um, but really work to see how the arts could be utilized even more, right? Um, integrated more into the core curriculum. Um, and I think it, in thinking of a, a place where we have a, um, a, a more inclusive uh, education and one that really shows the value of, of, of who we are as part of the African diaspora, I think that is the way it's going to be. There's going to be the dance, there's going to be, you know, write, writing, there's going to be singing, there's going to be drumming, there's going to be food, there's going to be all the different ways um, that we express. And that's going to be integrated into our maths, our science, our, our civics, our social studies, all of that. I love what Winston just said. Um, to add to that, what I would say is that um, COVID and the current administration have, it has unveiled um, the layers that you mentioned before of what our educational system currently is. So like Winston said, we went through uh, the majority of the year, you know, you've set your tones, the kids know what they're supposed to do, the teacher knows what they're supposed to do, and then there was this halt in March. And so then we had to jump into remote learning, like he said, some teachers are not doing remote learning. A lot of children don't have access to Wi-Fi, forget uh, even, you know, remote learning. You know, you have five kids in a home and then they're all supposed to share the same computer. How does that work in what world? So this, I, I put the two together and I'm, I'm not gonna try and make a connection. You can do that on your own, but COVID and the administration have basically, this, this whole thing has unraveled because it was basically for me, it was a farce. This was not, it wasn't real. It's never been real. It's never been real for black folks. It's never been real for brown folks because it also, at the same time, what also happened was the murder of George, George Floyd. So I have to bring him in there too. Now, many of us are already, I'm going to use the word woke, but then there were a lot of people that were not as aware or woke until the murder of George Floyd because it was on camera. Okay, so now there's other conversations that are having and we're gonna bring the arts into it because for me, the artistic piece comes in where we redesign our education system as a whole. It can't just be the North has their way of doing their things and then the South has their way of, of educating children. It can't be like that. We have to push the narrative of black and brown folks into the education system because we contributed. Um, this is not, this is new for some people, people that don't look like us because they're now aware. So what, I'm not gonna say the people on this panel, we, we're woke, we're aware, we know what, what, what really went down. I'm pretty sure most of us on this panel had two lessons. You had the lesson in school and then you went home and had another lesson about our contributions to this country and this nation. So for me, um, restructuring, because I said defund, but defund, refund, um, restructuring the education system from the bottom and rebuilding it. And so that you're also including um, the truth about everyone's contribution to the, the narrative that we are currently in. And then you're also building the whole child. So we're talking about the emotional stability of children as well being emotionally responsive. There's trauma that is involved in this whole COVID situation from March on. People that have passed away, that have died, that are, in, that are sick. Children are isolated in their homes. We're talking about adults, but we're also talking about children. We're all dealing with some type of trauma, whether or not we know it or not, or whether or not we acknowledge that. 
So there's an education that is needed for everyone, but specifically with the children, redesigning that, including emotionally responsive practices and telling a child how beautiful they are on the inside as well as on the outside, all of the children. It's not just the white children, it's the black and brown children as well, and validating their feelings, their emotions, and the things that they are also going through every day on the streets of wherever they, wherever they are. Um, children that are living in rural areas, in urban areas, in the country. Everybody has their experience and everybody's different and we need to do, begin to accept fam, uh, children, um, and children do this already, but the differences, accepting the differences and celebrating what is different. Stop trying to put everybody into this little box that doesn't work. It's okay that my nose is bigger than yours and that my hair does this curly thing that yours doesn't do, but it's okay that your hair is straight and it grows this way and your skin is lighter. That's okay. My last thing for that is that I, it, it pertains to this in the way that I feel like children, they, don't, they, they see color and it's okay that they see color. That, that, that's the reality of it. What I heard, and I, I like to repeat this, is that children don't assign a value to the color. And that's the point that we should be leaving with this restructuring and not assigning value to the individual unless you're talking about their personality. Thank you. And I agree with all of that. I really do. I have a six year old, and so in her class, is, um, this is just me. I chose a, a school that is African American based, but there's maybe two, you know, that are not, and she doesn't see it. They're beige to her. They're not white. They're not Hispanic. They're beige. That's <laughs> <color>. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> but Akila just graduated from high school, you guys, class of 2020. She has um, big applause. She has accomplished a big feat in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Akilah's also old enough to um, have at least been around with Hurricane Katrina after effects of Hurricane Katrina. So I want Akilah to talk to me, talk to us, I should say, what is your vision for education to, to have your voice in people like you seen and heard? Oh, my vision? Um... It's so, uh, as a writer, it's so interesting to reimagine the future because um, we can write about it every time. We write about those different fantasy stories and stuff. So um, I think uh, reimagining the future is like what artists, what artists do. Uh, but for me in particular, like being from New Orleans and experiencing the education system, um, I, I will say um, I... When I came, like when I came and I was in first grade and I was experiencing like um, RSD, like the recovery education system um, after Hurricane Katrina and new teachers were coming in, um, it kind of felt like it was uh, kind of thrown together in the sense that like, okay, like what's the next, like what's the next move for like these children in New Orleans? Mm -hmm. And um, it, at points it felt like we were just given any teacher um, to just teach us something, whether it was pertaining to our history or, or who we were, it was just it was just what was given. And I came I came up in you know the part where you had a lot of teachers who who weren't from New Orleans. Like you had a lot of teachers from different um, you know integrative programs from all over the the U.S. So necessarily like my first few teachers were um not from here I, I can't remember this one instance where i got a d on my math test like y'all i am not that good at math I, i've been struggling but my best friend she got an a and we used to sit, sit next to each other in third grade and we had this white teacher who wasn't from here i think she was from mississippi or she lived in mississippi and she was angry and she was angry at the the, um, the the students for getting low test scores and so she held up my paper and she was like this is not what you want and she put my paper down, slammed it on the desk, and then she took my best friend's paper who had an A and she put up, this is what you want. And you know, that was embarrassing, you know. I was already insecure about math, you know, I didn't feel smart. 
And here was this teacher, um, you know, basically humiliating me in the, in the whole class. And those experiences, I don't want, I don't want future students to have. You know, you shouldn't be embarrassed. You, that, 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 these should be a learning moment for the teacher. Maybe she's doing something wrong. Um, but, but, def but definitely, I, I, I do think, um, I don't want to have to, um, send my kids or you know my friends send their kids and the kids that come they're coming in the future to a school where they have to second guess who they are um i definitely do imagine an education that is um based in you know all cultures you don't look at um history education through you know a white westernized lens um, you look through it through an integrative lens um a humanitarian lens when you're looking at history you don't in my experience at high school, we would learn about African American history or um, Indian history, and we would only learn about it for one day. Then we would switch gears back to European history, and that's something um, I think should change in schools. You know, you know, we shouldn't be the aftermath. We shouldn't be the elective. You know, we should be the the, the main history, uh, especially because you know we were talking earlier about advocating for yourself. I think a big part of knowing who you are and self discovery is learning about your own history, and we're robbed from that because if we find out who we were, you know, it would be a whole lot of trouble for them. Um, I, especially, I think uh, we young people because. Like when we recognize the power that we have, it's like nobody can tell us nothing. You know, once we learn that bit of history, like, well, actually, we did this, 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 and this. You know, learning about that in the history segment. So I do imagine an education system where, you know, Black history, history for folks of color, you know, queer history isn't the second thought or isn't a, an elective you pick to study on one Friday. You know, it's a part of the entire education system, and you actually can learn from it. Um, you don't, you know, you don't paint the the people who did the the horrific stuff in history as the victors. I, I definitely think um, some we need we need the defund and we need a refund. <laughs> um, definitely, because there's so many things that I had to unlearn and and relearn. You know, as I'm getting older and doing my own research, and I think um, a lot of the things that I had to learn on my own they should have already existed within the education system. And also, I should children should shouldn't have to ask permission to take care of their bodies. I shouldn't have to ask to go to the bathroom. You know, I think that's one of the things that you like you're, you're socializing children and tell and you're telling them to not have agency over their own bodies. And I feel like you learn that in school. So I have to sit this entire two hour class period and hold myself. I think um, that's another thing that needs to change. Children need to learn to have agency over their own bodies um, and not be socialized to do otherwise. So I'm just gonna uh, chime in and, and just say that, first of all, you guys were absolutely given any teacher. Post Katrina in New Orleans, you were given any, any teacher. If you know anything about New Orleans, New Orleans culture, New Orleans community, you can't put any teacher in the New Orleans public school system. You just can't. New Orleans is like no other city in this country. You know, and I'm, I'm from there, so I'm, I'm impartial, but you can't just put any teacher that doesn't understand the culture of New Orleans into a school system and, and expect the students to benefit from that teacher being a part of that, not being a part of that culture. Secondly, I wanna add this artistic aspect of learning um, and in that as artists, as teaching artists, we have to make sure that especially when we're teaching that it's very intentional as, as artists, as teaching artists. You don't go into a space and not have an intention for where you're going. And there's always an intention behind what you're doing. Hey, I'm getting paid this money, so I'm gonna go ahead and do this gig. Hey, I'm getting, you know, I'm getting, there's always an intention, but for yourself and for your personal growth as an artist, as a teaching artist and being involved in being accountable for other students and what they're learning, we have to make sure that we're definitely, definitely intentional about what we're teaching. Um, Post Katrina in New Orleans, that's why I'm in Atlanta. Post Katrina education in New Orleans, that's why I'm in Atlanta. I love New Orleans. However, the education system there is not beneficial and, and they're not teaching the kids what they need to know. 
they're, they're, they're not, it's, it's not, it's not growing a community, a community again, community. Um, it's not growing the community that's there. It's not co growing the community that needs to be there or that was there prior to Hurricane Katrina. Before Hurricane Katrina, I'm not gonna say the city was perfect, but we have our ways. We were growing. I grew up in a public school system in New Orleans. Who that? Y'all already know where it's at. Um, but three five. <laughs> three five. <laughs> um, but it was a system that was built to support me as a student. My teachers, a lot of my teachers were from New Orleans or from Louisiana. A lot of my peers, they weren't from everywhere. So the teachers knew how to get through to us. And it was a community that was connected. My grandmother was a cafeteria lady and I knew that I couldn't do what I wanted to do in my school because it was gonna get back to her. And that's the kind of community that we had that I feel like we had pre-Katrina because everybody knew everybody. Everybody knows everybody in New Orleans. Now it's, it's not the same. And as a result, there's less accountability. You were talking about um, students not having access or not having um, say over their own bodies. And in, in some sense, I, I completely agree with that. But in some sense, in New Orleans, yeah. Yeah, you let a kid go to the restroom, they, yeah, you might not see them again, pretty much. You know, and, and this is not even New Orleans, but a lot of, a, a lot of different places. Um, if there's, you know, you have to have some kind of control, but it's also, it also comes with understanding and knowing your student. So if I know this student is a, a jokester or is just going to say, I'm going to, I need to go to the restroom, just to go and clown around in the hallway, you know your students beyond just teaching A, B, C, D. And that's where the system needs to be. Our teachers need to know their students. If you don't know your students, then why are you here? If you can't relate to your students, then why are you here? If you can't be intentional about what they're learning and pouring into them everything that's gonna make them as successful as possible, then why are you teaching? why it makes no sense whatsoever and unfortunately a lot of students in new orleans are suffering because of it on top of the mental health issues that are there you know it's it's like <laughs> it's like an array of things just toppled on top of each other and to add to akila's point real quick about what the teacher did to her as far as showing her grade and the other students grade i want to make a public service announcement and i hope that a lot of dance educators and directors and choreographers are watching this, stop communicating violently with your students. That is a myth. And you don't need to communicate violently with a student in order to get the best out of that student. You can communicate with compassion and still be assertive in what you want, but you do not have to communicate violently, especially for us in dance education where we say, you know, we're trying to convey a human experience on stage. How the hell are you conveying a human experience if you are dehumanizing somebody by disrespecting them in the classroom and in the studio and in rehearsals? It is unacceptable, just unacceptable. And I empathize with Akila because it happened to me and my director told me that she did it to me because someone did it to her. That's none of my business. Just because someone did it to you does not mean that you carry on the same behavior. Learn to heal the unhealthy conditioning so we all can move forward. And it's going to be important, especially now, because now that there is so much recurring trauma, these kids are coming back to school demanding their respect. They're not going to wait for it. You know, a lot of them, especially who've had parents that are essential workers and they have little siblings that they had to take care of, their maturation rate is going exponentially. So they're gonna come back demanding like, hey, you can't talk to me like that. You know, I'm, I know just as much as you and even more. So again, public service announcement, please respect your students. It's a two-way street, but most of us as educators, let's be honest, we are very violent and it has to stop because you also don't know what child is coming with what trauma 
And a lot of us are responsible for killing a lot of the dreams that our students have because we keep projecting um, our negativity on them. It has to stop. And I think it goes back to something that we were talking about before about healing and doing your own personal work. Um, in order for the community to grow, we have to work on ourselves, right? We have to understand who we are. We have to allow ourselves to have the emotions that we have, but to process them effectively and efficiently so that we can then come into a space and share, right? Whether that be in the classroom or that be in the supermarket, we're, we're, you know, on the street, at the, at, the, at the barbecue, wherever it is that we are um, living life, we need to be able to come to that place from a healthy place emotionally, which means we have to do the work, right? So I, I, I totally saw that point in what you were saying, Maxwell, that it's very important. And Winston, you were talking earlier about dance being this kind of force of energy that mm -hmm. is healing, right? So when we think about this level of violence to the Black body in schools, in dance, in the arts, you are literally sending someone on stage to supposedly be in a healing space, to share that with the world in fear. So this, this body has been, it's, it's called, it's a trauma contagion. So it is a contagious form of violence. So whatever we pour into these bodies, get shared with the world. So this dance, while it might have been extremely beautiful, it, it, it shared the trauma contagion because it was, it was beaten into submission to give you that performance, right? And so just think about the, the crispness and the healing quality of a, of a dance that could take place under a different type of tutelage, right? And when we talk about the schools, during Katrina, um, any school that has predominantly black children that is not centering blackness is just off target, off brand anyway. Um, we have to know that if we have schools that are, have predominantly black children, you have to center blackness. And we're not just talking about textbook blackness. We're talking about you have to bring arts in there. You have to bring uh, their ancient histories in there. You have to start to create a culture for students. And that is something that is really problematic across the board with our school systems, is having predominantly Black students only learning European history and the fluffed up version of European history. Because I've read the history of white folks and other white scholars that talk about their history and how they, over time, this history, it's always been violent. So I'll just wrap it up and say that we have to learn to center Blackness in our, in our schools where we have um, Black students. Yes, um, I agree with you. I agree with you 100%. Um, I think that our students need to learn in different ways. They need to learn. Um, they need to learn how to read. They need to learn how to write. But they need to learn it through a dance, through drama, through visual arts, through to acting, they need to learn in many different forms of art to, because they're so pained and so damaged. And so I think that we, we, we are in pain as a culture. And so we may not learn and connect the European style of, of doing it. We have to do it the way we know how to do it. And so I totally 100% agree with you. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, for my daughter, I chose, and this is how I was raised. I believe in the fact that, number one, my daughter, my, myself as a child, needed to see a representation of myself in front of the classroom. Mm -hmm. I don't think a European or any other culture can relay the message to me as clearly as I need to be. That's why I went to McDonald's. 35. McDonald's. 35. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you don't understand the legacy of that school. Just Google it, look it up, okay? 100 <laughs> years of teaching only black students. No other cultures are allowed at the table. Which brings me to this last thing. 
And I want you to think about it in the lens of your superpower. We have finances, we have education, we have nutrition, health, mental health, activism, um, writing. We have other holistic practices on this um, Zoom with us, right? Is it important to have a seat at the table or do we need to create our own table? Ha, Akila, you start because you're giggling. <laughs> we need two tables. We need to have our own table, but we also need to be at the other table because the other table is still where the decisions are made and where everything is, where all the power is. So we can still have our own table. There's nothing wrong with um, having our own table. I, is, we shouldn't apologize for um, being black and being who we are and having culture because everything doesn't need to, um, everything doesn't need to mesh all of the time. Sometimes it's okay to have your own. And as a people, as black people, as brown people, as Asian people, they have their own. Jews have their own. The Asians have their own. We need to have our own. And we do in some instances. And that's okay. It doesn't mean you're anti-establishment or anti-anything. It means I am for this. I'm for my own. I'm for uplifting my own people. And I want my people to be at the same level as everyone else. So, yeah, two tables. Our table where we can do what we need to do with a focus on what needs to happen for our community, but we still need to be at that other table. We need to have seats at the other table. We can't just not have, we can't just have our own table. That's not gonna work, because that's not the world that we live in, in my opinion. Okay, so you, we need two tables, all right. Akila, hop on in. Um, now, for, for me particularly watching everything going on and um, learning a lot about what abolition means, um and you know what does liberation look like and thinking about different things um i think the other table the legs of the table were just our backs like you know the way their table works is like how their their table is dependent on us so i do think um we can take their table and use it for firewood to warm our table um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and thinking about what, what liberation looks like for me i think um I believe we are past reform. You know, we tried to reform so many things, you know, over the years. I've watched my parents struggle, my grandparents, my grandma, you know, sit at the sit at do sit ins and talk about her experiences. So I, I do think um their table is past reform and fighting for a chair. Cause uh I, I definitely do think um formulating our own table and we do have our own table in many instances, um, in terms of artistry and art, um in the way we've cultivated our, you know, over these past um, generations. I think we've been able to form our own table with that um, and cultivating beautiful art at that. But I do think in terms of um, systemic change, I do think um, we need to defund and we need a refund. <laughs> so I feel like we can get our own table, but the table got to go. Hashtag for this old call, some B. Right. Be fun, hashtag refund. Krista, <laughs> oh, you hopping in? Yeah, I'm hopping in. So I, I feel like, so here's my take on it. We need our own table. And I feel like us as people of color, brown and black skin, we need our own table, but we also need to realize that our table is in a room with a group of other people that we can't necessarily throw away or get away from. So we have to build structures and policies in place to make sure that our kids know their history for themselves, even before we can go and visit another table. It's okay, y'all are here with us, all of us are here together. I don't need to sit at the table with you, but what I need to do is make sure that our kids understand our history and where we come from, that they're proud of who they are, that they're healed, that all of this traumatic, this drama that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation is healed so that when they do go and visit the next table, you know where you come from and you aren't afraid of where you come from. You're not afraid of being black. You're not afraid of being brown, but you can go and sit at that table with pride in who you are. And if you can go and sit at that table, people are gonna look and they're gonna say, oh, they know who they are. We can't tell them who they're not, who they're not. We can't tell them that we're superior to them. 
because because we're not we can't tell them anything because they are aware very aware of who they are they are aware that their ancestors live within them they are very aware of that and if our kids can't be aware of that then what are we doing as a community if we can't say let's sit at our table first and make sure our table is taken care of it's okay we're in this room with a whole bunch of other people but we we at our own table right now and then once we get our stuff together let's let's go ahead let's let's make this happen let's let's have some friends you know and even before we get our stuff together it's okay to have friends that are not at your table it's 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 perfectly fine because there are allies and what we have to realize that any social change has happened because of the allies not only us because us saying oh we're tired of getting killed that has not done the job that has it, it's taken allies that stand with us that have stood with us generation after generation after generation they stood with martin they stood it's taken those people who recognize that this is absolutely wrong what's happening to black and brown kids it's absolutely wrong and it's wrong on a humane level not on a, a theological level or anything it's wrong on a humane level and once you think about that once you take that in consist into consideration and once those allies realize that and own up to it then we all can move forward at some point it ain't happening right now but we can all move so let's 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 get our table together let's make sure our tables together let's make sure we have all our fancy who that cups and and our fancy liquor and you know and and, and let's do it and then we can say you know what we have a, a strong a solid foundation a very solid foundation I agree. I mean, I think I also I think that we definitely need to be at two tables. Um, and I think in terms of any type of movement or change, you have to you have to attack it from with a multi prong approach. And we all have different paths and we have different strengths and we have to use them as a community and understand that we all have those different strengths and we're going to use it. So I think definitely having our own table, developing our own table, but having people at the other table who are working in a different way for the same cause. Um, and I liken that to, um, you know, I have ed educator friends who work in predominantly black or brown schools. I work in a predominantly white school, right? Um, and, but I feel like we're both doing the same work. As I'm in that dance studio, for those one or two or three students that I have that look like me, I'm representing, you know, education, I'm representing arts, I'm representing um, love, I'm representing expression, all in that space, right? Where they're surrounded by people who, who may have various feelings about what that should be, but they feel represented by me. And while I'm there, I'm also teaching our history, right? I'm teaching about the Haitian Revolution through dance. I'm teaching how that's linked to the French Revolution. So I'm teaching that subject, but I'm bringing in our history in it, and I'm teaching it to our, our black and brown kids. And I'm also teaching it to the kids who are, are other ethnicities, because they need to see that information and learn that information in academic spaces and not just in entertainment form. But then the, the educators that are in the black and brown schools that are, that are there for the, for the majority of the community are doing a lot of heavy lifting and hard work too. So we're like both doing the same work, but we're on different paths, but it's for the same cause. And I think that's how I look at the two table um, question. Like we have our table, we also need to be at that table, but we need to have the same intent. Wow. I agree with everyone wholeheartedly. I like the idea of the two tables, but I would also want to encourage us um, to do like, you know, how we used to do in middle school in the DOE and take both lunch tables and put them together. And my philosophy is this. We love a rainbow because a rainbow has seven different colors. So if a rainbow has seven different colors and you know we feel so inspired by it, then I think we also need to acknowledge that it takes different intersectionalities and different experiences 
to create this humanity that we want to live in. Yes, it's important for us to have our own, you know, um, collectives. And yes, it's important for other people to have their own collectives to build. But when we get together, oh, what a happy day will be. So I personally would love for us to merge the tables together. Okay, so, um, so there should be, I believe, three tables. There should be one table for for us, because um, as someone said before, um, we need to know who we are to know where we're going. We also need to know what the enemy is doing on the other side. So we're gonna keep them, we're gonna feed them with a long spoon. So we're gonna make sure we at that table too, but we're really focusing a lot on, on our own table. And then the third table is that table that you just do for yourself every single day to be able to even be part of table number one and table number two. So that the third table is that just for yourself. That's the table just for me to do my breathing, to do my healing, to do all the stuff I need to do to be able to go to table number one or table number two. Hey man, I couldn't agree more. I think that we definitely need to be, uh, to have multiple tables. Um, for me, as an engineer, I have never worked in a group with another black person. Every time I walk into the room, I am the only black person in that room. And my presence there is more necessary than ever before. How will they know what our needs are? How will they know the black experience if I'm not there in that room to represent um, what it is that life is as a black man in America? Um, when I completed my yoga program, once again, not only was I the only black male there, I was the only male there in the room too. So in every space that I've been in, Maxwell talked about the intersectionalities, we, I realized more and more and more that we need multiple seats at multiple tables. Um, and what's most important is that we are present at the tables. Uh, we are present at the all white table, but I also need to be present on a call like this so I can be poured into. Because uh, as we know, life as a black man in America can break you down. But it takes coming back to a community like this one, um, where you can be poured into, so you can be rejuvenated. You can do the, you know, you can go go back to your other table and then do your breathing exercises and take on the day, because we gotta pour into our, ourselves so that we can go out into the world and do the work that we were called to do. So. Um, I think we are close to ending. This has been such a great conversation. I didn't even get through all my questions, y'all. I need a part two. We didn't even go through the timeline. Like, we're, we are in the middle of Black Lives Matter. We didn't even touch on that yet. Uh, we didn't touch on, you know, the importance of Black financial literacy. We haven't touched on that. Look here. I didn't get through my questions. Okay? So, <laughs> Pule and the team of um, Whole Heart Productions. So we're gonna have to do a part two so I can get through my other page of questions. But I do want you guys to give us your last thoughts on whatever you wanna leave the audience with um, about the state of black, let's look at two lenses because I have educators on here and I have artists on here, but the state of the black culture or community in your area. Okay, be it financials, be it um, activism, protesting, Black Lives Matters, be it education. What is your last like nugget you want to give us? We can have your last thoughts, right? Um, you guys have been great, and I have enjoyed our conversation. I just want my last little piece of nuggets. Okay, who wants to go first? Maxwell, your eyes are moving. Come on, Maxwell. Ready, set, go. You matter. What you do and how you do matters, whether it's in education, your finances, your community, wherever you are, as long as you remember that you matter, keep on you doing those things that uplift you to create better vibrations for everybody around you and yourself.
I think it would be good for everyone, um, black, brown, and everyone, um, to make to take to make time to learn something about the African diaspora and history, right? And to do that, you know, set a schedule once a month, choose a book, choose a documentary, choose something, learn about it, and start to have discussions about it. Because the way that we can bridge where we are to where we're going is for both adults and children to grow and learn. Um, and so that's, that's the nugget that I would like to leave. Um, I would say, as an educator, just to think about the children, think about what we want for our children um, in their future, get down on the child's level and begin to understand their perspective of things because they are clean slates. Um, so basically what is happening is that everything that we do, everything that we see, they absorb that information. They don't come out with those, with, with high expectations except for, you know, the, the gift of unconditional love. So looking at the whole child um, and thinking about what you want for your child as they continue to grow and as we continue to groom them, um, whether it's in the arts or in education, as we combine the two together and make, again, the whole child. It's about the whole child because they grow into whole adults. As I think about this question, uh, my heart and my mind is going to uh, those who are protesting, the young people, everyone who is just out there representing the needs and really blowing the trumpet for the black community. And what I see that we need more so than ever before is to uh, listen to our bodies, really listen to, to what we need in this moment. My concern is really that, you know, this is a long haul fight. This isn't an overnight thing where, where change is gonna happen tomorrow. And we have to pace ourselves. We have to be out there on the front lines. We have to be, you know, signing petitions. We have to be, you know, calling our Congress people. We have to get out there and vote. Black people, make sure you are registered to vote in your district, wherever you are in, this, in these United States, it's because it's only your vote that will make the changes that we need uh, in the long term. But also make sure that we are, you know, taking a moment for ourselves. We talked about how do we show up for ourselves earlier. You know, make sure that you are showing up for yourself. Make sure that you're eating uh, with nutritious foods where you can get them that, you know, you can feed into yourself. Make sure you're taking a moment to breathe, making sure that you're taking a moment to rest yourself. Because if we don't rest, if it's not the diabetes that's going to take us, if it's not the COVID that's going to take us, the stress of this life will take us. So please make sure that you take a moment for yourself. So, so um, piggyback on what you're saying, we're going to take care of ourselves, but also, oh, sorry. You're clear for me. Go ahead. Um, and that was piggyback on, on, on what he was saying in reference to uh, taking care of ourselves and making sure. I think the most important thing of all, as a people, we need to be, we need to forgive ourselves. We need to um, we need to let go of the pain, this pain that we carry. We need to let go of it. Um, when, when you forgive, you release yourself from a painful burden. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to forget that it has happened, but it just means that you're going to let it go so you can grow and move on. I think as a people, we need to forgive ourselves. And once that forgiveness happens, we can go wherever, we, wherever our minds uh, lead us to go. So um, for me, um, the state, I would say we always have to remember to love first. Love first um, in that loving for all, in that loving all would come healing. Um, it will come open communications. We have to remember our allies because our allies, those that stand with us, are the ones who are going to be able to communicate to those that they know 
that don't stand with us. They're going to be able to to transfer that information to them to say you're wrong. And it's going to come from a face that looks like others. It's not going to come from our mouths. We've been saying it long enough. But if we trust, if we love, if we communicate our needs and our wants with our allies and know that it's out of love, know that it's intentional, then we can move forward to heal. It's very important that love from love comes healing and that we want to continuously move forward with the intention of loving, loving, loving the human, loving the spirit, loving where it's connected at and loving where we need to go. Um, for me, I would say um, listen to young people. Um, you know, ask young people what they need, you know, you know, y'all see us fighting out there, doing what we got to do, ask us what we need, even if it's a pack of pistols for school that's about to come, you know, hear us, ask for what we need, um, listen to black girls the first time, listen to black women, queer black women, trans black women, cis black women, listen to us the first time, um, <laughs> and also, um, yeah, and also know that there was, there was, the responsibility of the future doesn't only rely on young people. You know, older people can also change the future. You know, it's a collective thing. So, um, yeah. Okay. Tanaki, you want to leave a last moment? Sure. I see you and hear you. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so this, this has been really amazing and incredible. Um, one of the things that I, a few of the things that I wanted to share is that all the things that we're talking about doing are remarkable. I think we're talking about where we are now and, and the systems within which we have to work versus what we're building and what we hope to build our own systems. One of the things integration did for us was take away our sense of independence in creating our own structures, our own institutions, our own businesses. And I think we're just at the tip of it now of starting to recognize that we need to go back to making those sacrifices to putting our own institutions in place and our own structure in place that totally centers blackness. Um, however, the revolution, and I will go on record as saying this, is impossible without psychological freedom. I don't care what you do. If, if the mind and the body is not in alignment and we don't have some kind of sense of that in terms of how we make moves, how we strategize, how we decision make, how we problem solve, we will end up creating a coup, being successful at the coup, and then turning into the oppressor. We only have, we have several major coups that have happened and where where countries have gained independence only to turn in the, into the oppressor at the end of it. So I would, I would stress that it is important for us to really get, um, really come to the mental health foray and insist that our government take it seriously, especially when it relates to black people. We need reforms. We need funding. We need more black clinicians because there's a dearth of them. There's not that many. Um, and I think now there's like, it's starting to build a culture around this mental health thing, but doing the work is one thing and talking about it is another one. And so I would say if we're going to build something and we're going to put something towards the future, we have to remember that for our children, because you're right, they're showing up with these multiple tra traumas and wounds and a lot of things, all aspects of our institutions and our businesses and every place else to be able to, to manage that and to help uh, in adults and children. One of the things that we really miss the kind of specialness of having rites of passage, right? Um, many adults never got that as children in the diaspora. And so that has created kind of a skipping of these natural initiations that were supposed to occur that we didn't get because we were enslaved people here being beaten 
really. And so what is it that we do with our existing racial trauma? That is something I think for each of us to really kind of do that internal work of, of recognizing that because we all said some of us really don't believe they have anything worse than anybody else, but we all got it and it's all bad and, <laughs> and it, it's, it's all dysfunctional. And so the most we can do, we're not going to heal from systemic oppression, ongoing systemic oppression, but we can find healing so that we are able to open up this free space and the free prefrontal cortex and these midline structures that give us a chance to decision make and problem solve for all of the stuff that we talked about today. So I would end with let's get our psychological freedom in order so we can have this restorative justice that we need. Oh, yes. I'm going to give a round of applause for all of that. <laughs> all of that. Because Girl, you had me signifying and rocking like I was in church <laughs> over here. <laughs> I was like, yes, yes, glory. <laughs> well, well. So we come to the end, and I want to thank you guys so very much for being on this call, this Zoom session with me. And I want to thank Sule Adams for actually envisioning this and calling me to step forward as a moderator. I've never done this before in my life. I'm usually behind the scenes with him saying, okay, cue and go. But he felt the spirit led him to put me in this place and I thank him for that. Um, and I thank each and every one of you guys for answering his call because he curated this panel by himself. And it was definitely, I think, spirit driven. I want to take the time to just honor Craig's memory and wish him um, much light on his transition to being an ancestor. And I want to all say, um, also say that next Wednesday, I hope you guys are able to join us. Okay. Um, we have Francine Ott, another New Orleans native, um, the artistic director of Francine Ott, The Walk. Um, she'll be leading and moderating a conversation with other artists regarding trauma and premiere her short film called Fragile. So the talk will be based around trauma. Um, if you look at the panel list, very good, worthwhile. Just come and sit with us for an hour and a half on the next Wednesday. And also, please go to Whole Heart Productions um, Facebook or Instagram um, page to find out more information because every Wednesday up until I think August 12th, August 19th or something like that, off the top of my head, um, he has something special planned for us as a community um, and we should definitely support him on it. 